So let's move on. So just to clarify why why the media is worth is worthy of study, uh, and you may have seen the statistics on this. I mean, they're, they're quite frightening. From for, uh, and again, I'm sounding like an old man here, but it is a little bit frightening when you see statistics. Um, often published by an organization called Ofcom. Have you all heard of Ofcom? O-F-C-O-M. Uh, write it down because Ofcom is um, it's the basically the regulator for the broadcast industry in the UK. Ofcom, O-F-C-O-M. Um, and they also do a lot of work in social media, broadband, digital connections, all that sort of stuff. And they produce uh, surveys every year that show uh, media usage, basically. And my generation, as you'll know from your parents' comments, they find it amazing that you spend so long on social media. I've seen some data that says six hours a day. Uh, you know, that, that kind of, when you assume that you're asleep for eight hours a day, six hours a day on social media is a hell of a long time. Uh, but it, for my generation, in fairness, we, our problem was television, because that was the most sort of glamorous, exciting thing when I was growing up, was TV. So my generation watched a lot of television, your generation uh, consumes a lot of social media. So media is worthy of study because people spend so long just doing it, basically. Um, and as we know from what we've seen so far with the data, the statistics, um, it influences our beliefs and therefore our actions. And the media on a grand scale can change the world for, the, for good or for bad. So for example, climate change. Uh, we wouldn't know about the dangers and the horrors and the immediacy of cli climate change had it not been for news reports on the BBC or CNN or social media showing the, the you know the protest of Extinction Rebellion and Greenpeace and all the others and David Attenborough. So climate change, we know about it. We can kind of see it out of the window sometimes when you get ridiculous temperatures in February or those awful fires that we had in Australia earlier this year or in California. Um, so we can see it, but again, we depend on the media. So the media is really worthy of study. And I underline and emphasize this because quite often when I speak to people that I know and they say, what do you do? And I say, I study journalism. I, and they come, some people kind of sneer like it's not, a worthy, it's not a worthy thing to do. But it is a worthy thing to do. And these are the reasons why. And hence, by ext extension, academic research is really, really important in all disciplines. But it's really important in the media as well, because what it can do, it can work against, it can counter uninformed opinion. Now, I've highlighted the word opinion because I want to talk about uh, opinion a little bit for the next few slides. Uh, let's move on. So, um, so it can be rewarding. Now, what I want to talk about now is, is the difference between opinion and research. OK, uh, and I'm going to tie it in with my own research, because that is something, obviously, that I'm very knowledgeable about. Um, now, for, for, the, for the British people in the audience and, and others, I don't know whether you know this or not, but the BBC is often accused of being left wing. Um, uh, and I, I'm assuming that the, the British people, and may, maybe our international friends, have heard this. Um, in the States, um, the, the media in general is sometimes called the liberal media, uh, President Trump. It still hurts to put those two words together, President and Trump. But quite often, politicians on the right, Republicans, accuse the American media of being liberal. So in the American sense, and I'm sure Cecily will back me up on this, the word liberal there is, is almost, it's, it's almost an insult. You know, it's like a pejorative term, the liberal media. Uh, and somehow the implication... Uh, they'll, Say again? They'll, they'll be, if, you try to, if you try to put your research online or something, um, to back like, oh, you're just a liberal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's the, you know what's important there, Cecily, is the word just. You know, you're just a liberal, you know. You know and we, we get the same in the UK. So, so media academics typically are branded automatically as being on the left, right? But let's go back to what I'm saying about the BBC. So hopefully everybody, all the Brits in the room, you, you probably heard this theory that the BBC is on the left, right? So let, let's let's just just take it from there of, of that of that is as being something which is a regular criticism, and this was the starting point of my of my research. Now the reason that that's a problem, if the, if it's true that the BBC, if it's true that the BBC is left wing, then that is a problem, and the problem and the reason it's a problem is there is a normative expectation. We had that just before the break. There's a normative expectation that the BBC and other broadcasters have an obligation to be politically neutral. It's a statutory, I can't say that word, statutory 
commitment to impartiality. So in the UK there are Acts of Parliament, it's the law that broadcasters should be impartial and not take sides on debates and conflicts. So if the BBC really is left wing, then it's not doing its job. In fact, it's breaking the law. So it's a really big deal, this is. It's a really big deal. And slide number 31 at the bottom, this comes from the BBC editorial guidelines, which says that its commitment to impartiality requires us to be fair and open-minded when examining the evidence and weighing all the material facts, as well as being objective and even-handed in our approach to a subject. So it's really, really important. And just to emphasize, if the BBC is left-wing, or right-wing for that matter, then it is failing on a major part of its mission. Now, this opinion that the BBC is left-wing is really common. Um, let's go back a couple of years. This is uh, 2015. Uh, that We had an election in 2015. Nigel Farage, and I, I actually wrote this down because I was watching the TV. Question Time, for those of you who don't know, is a debate programme. So you have a politician or a series of politicians taking questions from the audience uh, and then uh, answering them. And uh, Nigel Farage said, and Nigel Farage, of course, was leader of UKIP, uh, which is a pretty right-wing party. And he said about question time, there just seems to be a total lack of comprehension on this panel and indeed amongst this audience, which is a remarkable audience, even by the left-wing standards of the BBC. And the next day, Janet Daly, a commentator in the Daily Telegraph, a right-wing newspaper, said Farage was right over the left-wing bias of the audience. Truly shocking, even by the BBC standards. Um, a few more. Um, on the left there is an article by somebody called Boris Johnson, uh, who at the time, 2012, uh, was a journalist for the, the Daily Telegraph, talking about the the statist, defeatist and biased BBC. And on the right there, Richard Littlejohn, a rather odious right-wing commentator for a right-wing newspaper. Um, so he says, so the B I always think about Richard Littlejohn as being like the drunk bloke you meet, meet in the pub, you know. So the BBC denies it has a left-wing bias. Just take a look at the austerity-laden Christmas schedule. Well, if you read the article, Richard Littlejohn takes offence, believe it or not, at a Charles Dickens film because he says that Charles Dickens shows the deprivation of the Victoria of Victorian London and hence it's a left-wing uh, program. So people can see left-wing BBC in lots of lots of different guises. And so basically for as long as I can remember people have been saying that the BBC is left-wing, the BBC is left-wing. It's an opinion which gets repeated and repeated and repeated. And my area of knowledge and expertise is actually economic and business reporting and um, I started my PhD, what, gosh, in 2009, and a lot of the, 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 uh, the, the sort of impetus for the PhD was I was hearing this idea that the BBC is left-wing in the context of economics and business reporting. And one of the most vocal critics was this guy, Jeff Randall, who was the first BBC business editor. And I quoted him in my PhD, and look at the, the language he uses here. On his arrival at the BBC, Randall noted that the BBC was, and I quote, this is him speaking, Right, this is, I've actually got it somewhere, it's written down, culturally and structurally biased against business. Now, if you know anything about politics and economics, if an organisation or a person is culturally and structurally biased against business, basically they're a communist, or at least a socialist, so they are on the left. So Randall, as the boss of BBC Business Reporting, so he's, he's the main man, he believed that the organisation was essentially a socialist organisation, at the least, possibly a communist organisation. I'm amazed he ever got away with this, but it did stimulate my PhD. And later, this is after, after he left, reflecting his time at the BBC, he said the corporation treated business as if it was a criminal activity. Criminal activity, strong words, what, like drug dealing? Like fraud? You know, like some other, you know, some other awful crime? A criminal activity. So this really kicked off my research because in my experience watching bbc news and listening to bbc radio i couldn't hear a lot of left-wing influence at all and yet all of these people were saying over and over and over again that the bbc was left-wing so that's opinion that is the difference between opinion and research it's people saying things and as we'll see in a few minutes saying things that aren't necessarily substantiated by the facts and again, looking at the influence of the media, public you have public opinion. So we've had the pub opinion of Dr. Boris Johnson, Jeff Randall, Janet Daly, Nigel Farage. 
And the British public, a survey from 2013, twice as many members of the British public think the BBC is left-wing compared to them thinking that it's right-wing. And worryingly for the BBC, only 37%, that's a third of people, believe that it's neutral. And that's the most worrying thing, is because the BBC should be neutral. So only a third of people believe it. More people think it displays some sort of bias. And this is a perennial problem for uh, BBC managers and policy makers. So that's opinion. That's opinion. <coughs> and also, these days, of course, it extends to online. Let me just, um, this was on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. There was some debate. I know your generation doesn't really do Facebook. That's more sort of my generation, isn't it? Um, but it, honestly, it's my eyes rolled. I thought they were going to roll out of my head when I was reading this stuff. So slide number 36, here's some comments. There was a debate going on about the BBC. Let me just bring up slide 37. Look at the language that people use. So Cy Ferret, that's got to be a pseudonym, it can't be his real name. He says, the BBC is well known for its bias. Dave Hook says, it is extreme far left Marxist. Cy Ferret says, leftist agenda, and that's a fact. It's not opinion, it's a fact. Um, Joy Dev says most Brits don't trust the BBC. That's actually not true because if you look, particularly during COVID-19, the BBC has been the place that people go to for accurate reporting. That's actually not true at all. Uh, Cy Ferret uses the word definitely. Uh, Nick Horn says that the BBC is hated, far left, anti-British, fake news, lies, overpaid Marxist presenters, sickening, etc, etc. You get the idea, right? So look at the language. When you're, when you're, it's really, really important to look at the language when you're doing research, the language that people use. So we have all of this opinion. Boris Johnson's opinion, Nigel Farage's opinion, Janet Daly's. It's a little bit more measured <clears throat> than the opinion online, but still, online opinion seems to be that the BBC is extremely left-wing. Now, let's just talk about opinion as a whole, because I want to qualify this um, uh, quite uh, quite. Um, emphatically now the problem with opinion first of all don't please don't ever think that i don't value people's opinion because i do and everybody is indeed entitled to an opinion okay and we live in a free society thankfully hopefully same in the states as well in fact in the states it's a constitutional uh, right as i understand it to be able to say what you think and believe so america actually as a society is fundamentally very liberal in that respect because it's all about freedom freedom to do this and freedom to do that so freedom to to air your views and everybody in the uk um, is entitled to an opinion as in most other countries as well however however and this is a, an enormous however and sometimes i get criticized for saying these things the problem three problems with opinion number one it's often unsubstantiated so all of those people a minute ago on Facebook saying that the BBC is a Marxist far left sickening disgusting organization there's not there's no real substance to those statements point number two quite often opinion is based on feelings emotions and prejudices and we all even though the most even the, the most liberal caring sharing beautiful person still has prejudices believe it or not not necessarily bad ones but we all have prejudices. we all have tendencies we all have preferences Emo opinion is often, I wouldn't say always, but it's often based on feelings, emotions and prejudices. It's not actually based on fact. And the other point, which is what sometimes I get into trouble for, but I can prove it to you, not all opinions have equal merit. And this is really important when you're doing research. Now, let me give you an example here, because you might be horrified that I've just made that last comment. But let, let me give you an example. The photograph on the left there, a photograph of the moon. Let's go back in time, 500 years. Where are we? 2020. Uh, so to about 1520, 1600, somewhere like that. Imagine we're all standing Roehampton campus, where it is right now. And it's a beautiful dark night. And up in the sky, we see this beautiful full moon. And we're speculating about what it's made of. Made of. This is 500 years ago, remember? So some people speculate it's made out of this, some people speculate it's made out of that, and I'm going to take responsibility here. I'm going to say that it's made out of green cheese. Now, I, I wish I could see your faces now, because I'm sure you all smiled when I said that. But believe it or not, 500 years ago, people were making statements like that about the moon. 
And this is what you might call naive guesswork. That's the phrase I've used in the bottom left of the photograph, naive guesswork. So naive, in other words, you don't know. We, we, we don't have any first-hand empirical information. And it's guesswork. And people did used to say things like that because it looks a little bit like green cheese or different colour cheese or whatever it might be. Fast forward 200, 250, 300 years, then you start getting theories and logic. And that period in Western um, civilization, does anybody know what it was called? Sort of 1700s onwards. It was a period of great scientific discovery and philosophy really started to bloom. It was actually called the Enlightenment. You might want to write that down with a capital E, the Enlightenment. It's a period, certainly in the UK and in France and other European countries, great philosophers, great scientists started to, to, to really expand knowledge and they started to break away from the teachings, the pure teachings of the Bible um, and so on. And they started to investigate the scientific world. That's where modern science was really born. So round about that time, people started using telescopes. So instead of looking at the moon with your naked eye, you could use a powerful tel or relatively powerful telescope and you could look at the surface. And scientists and mathematicians started calculating, well, it's about, you know, however many thousands of miles away, so it's probably pretty cold up there and it doesn't look like it's got an atmosphere and from a distance it kind of looks rocky like a desert. So they started to come up with theories and, uh, and logic. using logic they started to understand a little bit more about the moon but fast forward another couple of hundred years it wasn't until 1969 July 1969 when Neil Armstrong and a couple of others they went all the way out to the moon and they walked on the surface and they took photographs and they took film and they brought some bits and pieces of rock and dust all the way back down to earth it went into a laboratory and they looked at it the scientists looked at it analyzed it and finally they had what's called empirical data. So write that word down, really important. It's empirical data. It's based on observation and experience. That's what empirical means. It's not just based on logic and on theories. So think about the example with the moon. It starts off with naive guesswork, and then you've got theories and logic. But really, the most powerful way of understanding the world around us is empirical research. And that's what I encourage you to do, empirical research. Let's go back to my contentious statement about not all opinions have equal merit. Now that we know what empirical research is and theories and logic, and we know the merits of them, we can talk a little bit more about that. Now, here's a great example. It's a true story, slide number 39. It happened a few years ago, February it was, around about my birthday. I had two problems on the same day. Very cold February. I woke up in the morning. I noticed the central heating hadn't come on. And there was something wrong with the central heating boiler. It wasn't working. So, and then I had some breakfast and had a piece of toast. And I was eating the piece of toast. And I cracked a tooth. If you've ever done that, it's painful and horrible. So I had two problems on the same day. A central heating boiler that didn't work and a cracked tooth. So what did I do? I rang up the plumber and I asked him if he could come around and have a look. And I also rang the dentist and went to the dentist and made an appointment later in the week. So, thank goodness, the plumber came around later in the day, fixed my central heating boiler. Later in the week, I went to the dentist and she told me that I needed to have a crown on my tooth. Now, the point here is not everybody's opinion is equal. Imagine if I'd gone to the plumber and asked him to look at my teeth. Or if I'd gone to the dentist and asked her to come and fix my central heating boiler. Now, if, you're in, if I was in the same room as you now, you'd probably be all smiling or even laughing or rolling your eyes because that is clearly ridiculous. But the point is that plumbers know a lot about central heating systems. They do a five-year apprenticeship. They do loads of jobs. They know everything pretty much there is to know about pipes and water and gas and heating and cooking and so on. And my dentist, she went to school, university, I think it's five seven, or seven years maybe for dentistry and again she's quite experienced she's about my age she's probably seen hundreds of, of mouths and thousands of teeth so she knows about teeth so not everybody's opinion is the, of the same validity so my dentist knows about teeth the plumber knows about central heating systems dare I say academics in media know quite a lot about their specialist subjects so when you're doing research everybody yes can have an opinion but just be aware that not everybody's opinion is equal. And I realise this is quite contentious because these days opinion is treated very democratically, like TripAdvisor, for example. So you can put a review on TripAdvisor 
um, and your review has the same weight as somebody else's review. You don't necessarily have the same experience, you don't necessarily have, dare I say, the same intellect, you might have an, an agenda with the restaurant that you're renew, uh, reviewing, it might be your ex-girlfriend's parents' restaurant and you don't like her anymore. Do you see what I mean? So not everybody's opinion has the same merit. So just be aware of that. Just be aware of that. Um, and also, another problem about being an expert, and I, and I wouldn't really call myself an expert, I'm getting there slowly but surely, and again I saw this on Facebook, slide number 40, uh, written by a, a guy called Frank Swain, and he says, you study for a degree for three years, three more for a PhD, join lab, start working, spend years studying problem, form hypothesis, gather evidence, test hypothesis, form conclusions, report findings, clear peer review, findings published, report in the press, and then a guy on the internet just says one word, bullshit. And that is, that is one of the frustrations of actually doing research. You can devote your whole life. My PhD took six years part-time. I analysed 1,625 articles from three different publications. I interviewed 26 BBC Guardian Telegraph journalists. And yet people, when I speak to them about my research and my findings, they still say I'm wrong. Well, I might be wrong, but, you know, I, I don't just want somebody to say I'm wrong in two words, you know. So that is one of the frustrations about research, and you will get that. And we'll talk about the, some of the meanings of those words um, in a moment. But let's move on and talk about what social sciences research is in general. Please shout out any questions, folks, or any comments if you want to say anything. I'll just have a sip of tea. Now, the reason I'm talking about social sciences rather than media is that it's important to see media in the context of the broader um, area of research. So we're talking social sciences. The key word there is social. So media, as you'll see from the list at the bottom, there's what, eight, nine subjects, disciplines there. It depends who you speak to, but generally, generally speaking, social sciences extend to anthropology. That's the study of uh, human beings, particularly human beings in groups and tribes and, and, and uh, professional groups and so on. Business and management, economics, human geography, law, media, politics, psychology and social policy and sociology. So the common thing here is social. It's all about people, individuals, groups, communities, professions. <coughs> social sciences, study of society and the manner in which people behave and influence the world around us. That's media, right? We, we can see media, we can recognise media in that statement. Um, another slight def uh, slightly different definition, the scholarly study of human society and social relationships. Social relationships, so even though you might not know journalists personally, a journalist on TV has a relationship with his or her audience. So there is a relationship, you have to obviously have to use a language that the audience can understand and talk about subjects that the audience wants to learn about. So media is definitely in the social sciences. <clears throat> now, moving on, slide number 42. This is really, really important, really important. And please try and incorporate this into your thinking when you do your research. With social science research, there are limitations. And, and especially with the undergrads, they get a little bit confused here. Unlike natural sciences, now you might want to write this down, natural sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, computer science, right? astronomy is probably a, na a natural science as well. Natural sciences, they deal in laws. So you've heard about Newton's law of motion, for example, uh, Faraday in, in, in terms of electri uh, electric, uh, electricity, um, gravity, and so on. These are, these are universal laws that always apply. So gravity always apply, unless of course you're in on the moon or somewhere. But gravity is a force. Newton's law of motion still applies 400 years after uh, the great man discovered it. And my brother, for the record by the way, is an engineer. And um, I remember chatting to him over Christmas dinner <laughs> uh, nine months, ten months ago about the difference in his world, which he's an engineer, so he's building power stations. He's dealing with metal and weights and heights and distances, a very different to the world that I work in. My world is all about people, individuals and messages and media. So he's dealing in universal laws. He's measuring things very, very precisely, distances and weights and so on. We don't have that in social sciences. Point, point number one. So, so it might. So you get to the crazy situation where certain things apply in certain si situations in the media, but they don't apply in others. There's no universal law. Media research will always, hopefully, surprise you. There's plenty of exceptions, and it always frustrates me when I'm talking about my research, 
and I talk about what I found about the BBC and then somebody will put their hand up and say, ah, but what about the programme I saw last week? Just because there's one ex exception, it doesn't nullify um, the, the, the dis discoveries, um, research discoveries. There's plenty of exceptions. <clears throat> and the third point is, is that causal relationships are difficult. And I thought about this yesterday when I was preparing the slide. Are they difficult to prove or are they impossible to prove? A causal relationship is when you say, well, the media is like this because... I don't know, all the journalists are white, right? So all the journalists are white, therefore they produce this sort of um, journalism. It, it's much more complex than that. They, somebody's ethnicity might be a, a reason, but it's not the only reason. There are other reasons as well. So causal relation, in natural sciences, you push something with your hand and you know what's going to happen to it. That's a causal relationship. You push something and you know it's going to move 30 centimetres. You can predict it. It's not the same in social sciences. Causal relationships... I'll go with difficult. They're very difficult to prove. So all you can do, really, in social sciences, at the bottom, you can observe, you can look for patterns, you can look for tendencies, and so long as you're methodologically robust, in other words, your recipe, how you do it, so long as that is robust and strong and you've thought about it, and more than anything else, that it's replicable. So if I did a methodology and then Catherine used the same methodology on the same data, you should, we should come up with the same answer. That's what re methodological robustness means. But just be aware of those three limitations in red. No universal laws, plenty of exceptions, causal relationships, difficult to prove. <coughs> and the reason is, it goes back to what social science is. The reason is, is that we're dealing with people. We're dealing with human beings. And human beings are emotional. They change their uh, minds. Um, they they, they um, are unpredictable. One day they'll believe X, the next day they'll believe Y, and so on. So human beings are unpredictable. And that's what makes, that's the joy really of social science research, because you're always learning something about people, about humanity, and so on. So all we can do is observe, look for patterns, look for tendencies. So long as we're methodologically robust, uh, we're doing okay. And then what we do in the pink oval there, um, we do the research it's reviewed and then we endlessly debate. So it's very unusual in social sciences that we come up with like a like the theory of gravity. You know, there is one theory that, that, that everybody agrees in. Um, and, and that again, that's one of the joys of social science because you can talk about it forever. The, the, the word in the middle there, review, what I mean by that, and I'm, I don't know whether you know this, but if you p produce a piece of research, like my book, for example, or a, a, an academic journal article, you write it and then it goes off to a couple of anonymous professors who read your work and they comment on it, rather like when you get your marks for your essays, they will comment on it and suggest how it can be improved. It's anonymous, so you don't know who's written this. Then the reviews come back to you as the author and you're expected to respond to that. You either argue your case and say it's not relevant, or if you want to get published, typically you acknowledge that your work has a few areas that can be improved. You make the improvements and then it goes back. That's called peer review. You hear it a lot now in the context of COVID. When, when people talk about research, a peer-reviewed paper says that COVID is infections are reduced if you wear a mask. A peer-reviewed paper from the University of Berlin said that's what peer review is. So that's social sciences research. Just be aware of the limitations. Uh, next slide. So where do you start? This is where I want to get you folks thinking about where you start. Um, now, let's go back to our friend Frank Swain. Uh, so what Frank has said, um, we're going to skip forward slightly. He said um, he spends years studying a problem. You form a hypothesis, you gather evidence, you test the hypothesis, you form conclusions, you report your findings, etc. So the first stages that he's talking about there, they're relevant to you. Don't worry about peer review and publishing your findings at the moment. That's if you're doing a PhD. But you do need to study problems and ideally form a hypothesis uh, and then gather evidence, etc. So let's look at some of the words. So what you're doing in this class, folks, is you're getting, some of you will know these words already. Um, some of you won't, but I'm just emphasizing the relevance and, and trying to bring them in the real world. So you might start with your hypothesis. Right, let me just qualify this. When you do your research, your dissertation, <coughs> it's not, not absolutely mandatory, but it helps if you either have a hypothesis or you're commenting on a phenomenon. So a hypothesis is a supposition or proposed explanation made on the basis of limited evidence, highlighted, 
as a starting point for further investigation. So a hypothesis might be, for example, the BBC is left wing. And the limited evidence that you would have to say that is all of the opinion that I mentioned earlier. So that could be your hypothesis. That could be your starting point for your, your dissertation. And then your dissertation would test that hypothesis. And you do that by gathering evidence. So you start off saying the suspicion, the supposition, is that the BBC is left wing. Then you design your research, you gather your evidence, and then compare your findings to your original hypothesis. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing research is to find a phenomenon. A phenomenon is a fact or a situation, basically something that's evidently happening. A fact or a situation that is observed to exist or happen, especially one whose cause or explanation is in question. So something that you've noticed, something that is demonstrably true, and then what you'll do in your research is explain it. Does that make sense? I hope so. If anybody has any issue with that, just think about it. So it's two, let me just clarify, these are two possible places to start. There are others, but I would say at this stage, just think about these two. So think about a hypothesis or think about a phenomenon. Now, next slide, let me give you an example. The, the two pieces of research I've done in recent years, the, the, the book at the top, The Political Content of Economic, British Economic and Business and Financial Journalism. I wanted a shorter title, but the publisher insisted on something descriptive like that, which is kind of annoying, but I got it published, which is the main thing. Right. So that book, which was based on my PhD, was basically kicked off by a hypothesis. It was related to everything you heard earlier about the BBC being left-wing. Because I've been hearing this for years and years and years and years, that the BBC is left-wing, the BBC is left-wing. And prior to the financial crisis, 2008, and during and after, I would be sitting there watching TV, watching the BBC, and I would be saying to myself, where are all the left-wing economists? I mean, economics is actually my intellectual passion. I've got loads of books on economics. There are famous economists, people, um, Cecily might know these people, Paul Krugman, Cecily, have you heard of him? Uh, New York Times, very famous American economist. He's Nobel Prize winning, so he's pretty good. Joseph Stiglitz, another American economist, Nobel Prize winner. And I remember watching the TV, the BBC, at the time of the financial crisis, and these guys were never mentioned. There's British left-wing economists, they're European, and they were never mentioned. So that puzzled me, because you've got people saying the BBC's left-wing, and I'm thinking, well, if it was left-wing, there'd be loads of left-wing economists on the BBC. So that was the starting point of my PhD. <clears throat> I noticed a mismatch between what people were believing and saying and what, my, um, what, what the limited evidence in front of me was saying. Um, and the other... A piece of notable research I've done recently um, is uh, this paper, and you can read it in a few weeks' time, when, when I do my class on the BBC, week five, I think, um, is a, a paper called, an 8,000 word paper called Representing the Nation, uh, and it looks at the social constitution of BBC journalists and politicians, and the reason I wrote this, the starting point was a phenomenon, and the phenomenon was I was watching the coverage of the EU referendum, uh, in other words, the Brexit vote uh, um, in June 2016, and all of the BBC journalists, if I close my eyes, they all had pretty much the same accent. And, it, and if, you're, if you're from the UK, accents, can you can actually spot quite a lot of things from somebody's accent. And I noticed that they had the typical, what I call the typical private school accent. If you go to private school in the UK, typically your parents are quite wealthy. Typically you come from a middle class background. And I noticed they all had pretty much the same accent, so I started investigating it. So that was a phenomenon. So one of my pieces of research started with a hypothesis, the other one started with a phenomenon. So you can do something similar with your research. You can either start with a hypothesis or you can start with a phenomenon. So let's look in real life. Now this, let me just reiterate, this is slide number 46. Slide number 46, this is not media research, right? So don't think this is media research, but it is social science research. It's all about football or soccer, whichever you prefer. Uh, so this starts with a phenomenon, and I suspect if it was in a category, this would probably be psychology. So the phenomenon is, in the Premier League, the season has recently started, the phenomenon is, and it's demonstrable, it's unequivocal, that... So far, there have been 144 goals scored in the Premier League this year, which is 40 more 
than at the same stage last season. So it's a 40% increase in the number of goals. Right, that's really important. Number one, so, and I, there's some words here that you might want to write down because they're all relevant. It's a phenomenon, so it's definitely happening. It's And it's unequivocal. It's not a matter of opinion. You know, it's not like I think there's 144 and my mate thinks there's 143. You can count them. There really are 144. It's empirical. In the little box there, I've defined what empirical means. Verifiable by observation or experience rather than theory or logic. Okay, so it's empirical data. It's quantitative data. In other words, it's countable. So on that slide, you've got three phrases which are really important in social science research. Phenomenon, empirical, quantitative data. And this actually is a really good starting point for some research. Not media research, but it is for psychology research. So tell me, folks, I've been talking too long now, but tell me, um, next slide, 47, question. How would you, as a researcher, start to explain this phenomenon? And question two, do you have any theories or hypotheses? So in other, let's just clarify. This season, there are 40% more goals than last season. Have a guess. Why, why do you think it is? Come on, you, you've all, you're all intelligent people. Why do you, you might not like football, but why do you think more goals have been scored this year than last year? What's the big difference? Let me, let, me just, let me just stop there. Right, that, so what, what Saeed has successfully done is you've come up with a hypothesis, right? Believe it or not, you have just come up with... Saida has successfully... Well done, Saida. Congratulations. You have come up with a hypothesis. So, Saida, if you didn't hear what she said, she said that... And I'm going to put one word in there, Saida, just to make it a little bit more uh, social science. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe... The players can concentrate better on the game because they're not distracted by the, sight, the noise from the crowd, right? Now, having been somebody who's played a lot of football in my, in my youth, um, I've never played in front of a big crowd, but the crowds do make a difference. So you, you could be onto something there. You could be onto something. So let, how would we test that? How would, so let, let, let's go with Saida's hypothesis. How do we test it? So we got a hypothesis, now we, do, we need to collect data, we need to do the research, what would we do? Anybody, not just Saida, but Saida, go on, you're on a roll, how would you test it? Yeah, I, I, can, I can see that's good, and then what, what Cecily's doing, whether she knows it or not, she's re recommended what's called a comparative study. Right, you might want to write that down, it's very popular, and I did it with my PhD, it was a comparative study. You compare two or more things. So in my PhD, I compared the reporting of the BBC with The Guardian and The Telegraph. And that's, that's a very, very useful thing to do. So Cecily, that, that's a very wise approach. You compare it to previ a previous example. Now, the problem with that, are you a sports fan, Cecily? No? You know, it, anybody who's played sport, anybody, the reason I ask that is anybody who plays sport know that it's virtually impossible to compare two things because every game is different. You know? So even if it's the same game, Liverpool against Manchester United, compared this year to last year, totally different thing. So, so it's a good idea, but I don't think I, I think you're right with the comparative angle. But it's difficult to compare a, the same game because they've got different players as well. Maybe they've got a different team, different weather, different circumstances. Okay, let's let's move on. But thank you, Cecily and Saida, for your input because the two of you are clearly thinking about this. So the way that the journalist did it, this is an article on, on BBC website. Go on to slide number 48. The way that the journalist did it was that, as journalists do, they speak to people. So really, journalism, in a way, my journalistic colleagues might destroy me for this, but journalism, in a way, is a form of social science research because you're interviewing people. You know, that's one of the things about social science does very well. So what the journalist did is that, is it a he or a she? I don't know. Let's say it's a she. She interviewed people. So and in, in order of sequence, so the first person she quoted, Everton and England defender Michael Keane. Second person, she quoted a journalist. Third person was a presenter, also a journalist. Fourth person, a coach. Fifth person, a manager. Sixth person, a sports psychologist. Seventh person, striker, footballer. 
eighth person, Micah Richards, a defender. So look at the bottom, I added them up. Three players, two journalists, two managers and one psychologist. Right, my question on the left hand side. Is everybody's opinion valid from what you see there? Are they all valid people? Cecily, let me stop you there. That's a fantastic thing, to, a wonderful observation and something, believe it or not, that I noticed in my PhD, which is talking about economics and business. One of the, what we call it in research is they are sources, sources of information. And journalists, in my research, were one of the biggest categories of sources talking about economics and business. And yet, ironically, one of the smallest categories in my research were economists. Isn't that bizarre? You're talking about economics and you talk more to journalists than you do to economists. That's one of the major findings of my research. And it's the same with football. You're absolutely right, Cecily. You get journalists talking about sport, whether it's tennis or football or golf or whatever. And the thing is that, and journalists would hate me to say this, but it's true, because they have control over who comes on the programme, they like to get their mates involved, you know, believe it or not. So you're absolutely right, Cecily, what the hell do journalists know about the psychology of football? You know, they may have seen a few games in their life, but they may have played it, but they haven't, typically haven't been professionals. But who else? Let me, let me, that's a very good comment, Cecily, thank you. Anybody else? Let's see if somebody else can join in. Is everybody's opinion valid? Cecily said journalist. She's questioning whether they have a valid opinion and that she's absolutely right to do so. Anybody else got some thoughts on this? Let me say what my thoughts are. When, when I read this article, I, as soon as I saw it, I thought sports psychologist. That's who we want. It's people who studied psychology in the context of sport for 10, 20, 30 years and they read books on it and they understand how sports people operate and they probably had loads of clients who've been in psychologically different situ situations and yet the psychologist there's only one quoted out of eight <coughs> and he Michael Caulfield is number six on the list if I were to write that article I'd probably have him at the top but maybe that's why I'm not a journalist anymore <laughs> but that's how an academic thinks an academic thinks about you know the, the, the sort of validity of an argument so Michael Caulfield of all those people is prob probably the most enlightened person on that list and yet his opinion is pushed down the list. And my second question is every no, it's my first question, is everybody's opinion valid? Sure. Nothing wrong with speaking to footballers, but in my experience, footballers aren't, as we say in the UK, they're not the sharpest tools in the box. No offence to them, but typically footballers, they leave school at 16. Their whole life from the age of about 12 is football, football, football. You know, and you can tell that when you read footballers' autobiographies. They don't really have a lot to say. You occasionally get somebody with great insight, but footballers don't necessarily typically have a huge amount of insight. They, they can't, typically can't explain how they do what they do. They're very gifted, but it's very difficult to explain how you head a ball or make a pass or whatever. It's one of those things that is a gift, like music in many ways. Um, so who is excluded? Um, this is a, a, a common thing. This is a, a good area for um, media research. Those are the people who are included who's excluded, whose voices are not heard. That's a really good area for media research. So who's not, um, who's excluded from that list? Well, you know, half the population is female, right? There's, I can't see a woman's name on that list. You know, but the, the, this is the thing. No public There's no what, Sosaida? It's no public opinion. They don't, uh, they don't ask the public. Right, very good. Yes, you're absolutely right. So my point, no females. Secondly, there's no members of the public, as Saida said. So football, as we know, typically you have football fans, people who spend all the money and devote their lives to following a club. No football fans there. Um, in fairness, I'm not sure whether football fans <coughs> would have great insight. They certainly wouldn't have the insight of a psychologist or maybe a footballer, but Saeed is absolutely right. So two groups of people who are excluded, the fans who pay the wages, and secondly, there's no female voices there either. There may, if you want to look at it in different ways, there's probably other people who are excluded. So that's an example of how you do social science research. I used it to show um, several things. A phenomenon, um, uh, empirical data, quantitative data, uh, and also sources is another thing, uh, and also a hypothesis. So within this example, you've got five real-life uh, um, concepts that are important in social science research. Let's look at another one. 
so slide number 49. Now, those of you who are in the UK in the summer, you'll remember this, this moment. Uh, this was when uh, the, the statue of Edward Colston was ripped down by protesters and uh, tipped into Bristol Harbour. For those of you who don't know, Edward Colston was an 18th century slave trader. And it's important to get this the right way around. He was a slave trader first, and then he was a philanthropist. And the problem that people had in Bristol, as I understand, I used to live in Bristol many years ago, was that typically those two things are switched around. So if you look at the statue, it says philanthropist, Edward Colston. Uh, and people in Bristol find it. Well, it's been going on actually. From, I remember when I lived in Bristol years ago, there were still issues with it, but it came to a head um, this year. And, uh, and basically the people of Bristol decided, some people in Bristol decided that his uh, presence and it was right in the centre of Bristol, um, right in the middle, uh, was that the time had come to get rid of him. And it caused quite a lot of friction, obviously, and a big debate in the UK. Uh, and in the bottom, this was, um, uh, again, the same day as the football story. <clears throat> there was a piece on the BBC News website, and it's a little video piece, and it says, Is Bristol united or divided? Now, when I saw this, two things came to mind. Number one, how race, ethnicity racial dynamics are reported in the media is a really strong and important area uh, for media research. And the second thing I thought was, I have got an issue with that question. Now, can anybody guess why I've got an issue with that question? Given, I, I, just to reiterate, I think that racial dynamics and racial relations are really important. But why is that question, is Bristol united or divided? What do you think my issue with it is? Now the problem, you're absolutely right, the word, again, what I'm trying to do here folks is introduce you to the terminology. So the word that you, I want you to write down is polarisation stroke binary choices, right? In social science, <coughs> polarisation and binary choices, they don't really exist, right? So if you, if you were to say, is Bristol united or divided, the implication of that is that the whole city of 500,000 people is either one unit or two units. And that's not how cities operate. That's not how social sciences operate. In any city, in any group of people, there are going to be exceptions. So you need to avoid polarization and binary choices. So please, when you, when you do your research, when you think about your research project, don't go down that track. Don't say, for example, you know, is the Daily Mail racist? You know, or I mean, it's a valid question, but just think about how you how you phrase it. So, social science phenomena are never never simple either or. Another example: I put two charts on pay, on slide number fifty, going back four years. EU referendum. The slide on the left: basically, fifty two percent leave, forty eight percent remain, and that's what you hear on the news all the time. Fifty two percent of people voted uh, for leave. They didn't. It's not true, because about a quarter of British people, amazingly, didn't vote at all. And that's, that's a phenomenon. That is fact. It's not my opinion. You look at the data. 24% of people did not vote. Or 26, actually. 26% of people did not vote. So even with a binary choice like the EU referendum, there are loads of people who don't vote. It's going to be the same with the, the American um, referendum, um, referendum election. You've got Trump and Biden. There are, as I understand it, other candidates as well. And a big chunk of American people won't vote. It always happens, ironically, in democracies. A lot of people don't vote. So don't you make statements like that, that Bristol is divided or Bristol is united. It's a valid subject for investigation, racial dynamics, but it, it's a terrible question. So be careful. So how would you phrase the question? How about this? This phrase is really useful in social science research. To what extent? To what extent? And that leaves the door open for more subtle investigation and explanation and analysis. To what extent is Bristol United divided over race? But of course, a journalist, they don't have many words to play with, so they and they want to be sensational. So they say, are we divided or are we united? But the, the reality is that it's much more subtle than that. So extending that principle um, to, um, to other um, scenarios. To what extent does the Daily Mail reinforce racial stereotypes? That could be a research question for your dissertation. To what extent does senior BBC journalists represent the British people? That was the question of my academic journal article I had um, uh, published last year. 
And another question, we're going to need to tie up a little bit now uh, because we're getting to the end. But how would you measure and assess racism? So that what I want to do is just give you an idea of, of what you can do with social science research. So um, race, race studies, for want of a better word, if you're talking about race and ethnicity, probably be part of sociology rather than media studies. But of course, you can incorporate uh, these issues and these, the, these topics into uh, media. But have a think about how you would do it. Um, I'm going to skip ahead and answer the question for you, but it's important to be able to measure phenomena. So racism, unfortunately, does exist. It's existed probably since the dawn of time, and I hope it's going to be eradicated at one point, but I'm sure it's going to exist to an extent for the foreseeable future. But it's important to be able to measure it, and if you can measure it, then you can maybe see if we're making progress. Maybe. So there's basically two ways of measuring something like racism. Um, and uh, in, in broad terms, slide number 52, you can either do it quantitatively or qualitatively. So you'll see those two phrases frequently in uh, social science research, quantitative research and qualitative research. The difference between the two, very similar words, quantitative means can you count it? Is it countable? Qualitative, as the word suggests, is the quality of the data. So quantitative, for example, if you're measure, measuring racism, you can measure how many young black men compared to how many young white men are incarcerated in jail, proportionate to how many people there are in the population. That's measurable. Um, how many um, ethnic minority, people from ethnic minorities in the UK have, uh, have um, three A-level results compared to how many white people in the same. That's, that's measurable. Okay, so you can generate and find data that shows the extent to which different groups are treated or how they, um, the, the, how they are treated by society. Qualitative might be, for example, interviewing people about their experiences of racism because they will give you a much richer detail. It's not measurable, but they will describe how things happen. Qualitative is also people describing how they do their jobs, what their beliefs are, so interviews, language, um, all that sort of thing, images, photographs, you know, what does an image say? That's qualitative research. So you've got quantitative, which is measurable, and you've got qualitative, which is the quality, the characteristics, if you like, of media. OK, let's move on because we're getting close to, to that time. Um, so we'll have time for questions at the end, but let me just give you a few bit more inspiration. I really encourage you, and you've probably seen this in the email already, um, but a really good source of inspiration is this program, a podcast, radio program, whatever you want to call it, called The Media Show on BBC Sounds. Um, I looked last night, there are over 600 episodes in the archive covering every subject you can possibly imagine. So if you get stuck for inspiration, go and listen to a few episodes of The Media Show. Um, and you might have some ideas already, if so, focus on those topics. Uh, and listen to some more. Make a note of the names of people who speak on the program. Sometimes it's academics. In my opinion, not enough academics are on there. Again, it's journalists um, tending to talk to journalists, as we saw with the football. Uh, but I'd quite happily go on there if they invited me on. Uh, but check out the media show. It's a really good um, starting point. And just to clarify before we round off, some key concepts. So these are the, these are the um, phrases that you should kind of understand now as a result of this class and hopefully it will get you thinking with the mindset of a research. So, so we know what social sciences are, now we know that it includes law and geography and, and uh, media and psychology and so on. Normative expectations uh, we know are what we expect things to be, it's normal, normative. We know the difference between opinion and evidence and we know that evidence is much stronger than just uninformed opinion. We know what a phenomenon is, we know what a hypothesis is, we know the strength of empirical data, so it's not based on logic or theories, it's actually based on observable um, facts or on experiences. And um, lastly, we know the difference between quantitative and qualitative research. Um, and just before we finish off, just a few things to, um, to avoid. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I put these in there, because of my long and varied experience, um, I, I've seen these things happen in student dissertations and research, and, and uh, they're not good. They're, they're, they're things to avoid. Please, number one, avoid the phrase, this proves. Okay, In social sciences, it's very difficult to prove anything. 
Better words are illustrate, demonstrate or suggest. Going back to natural sciences, where my brother works in engineering, there's lots of proof in natural sciences uh, because things happen consistently over and over again, but not in social sciences. So please don't use the word disproves at all. Don't, don't even think about using it because it's, it's really bad practice. Small or unrepresentative samples. Just because, for example, three or 3,000 bus drivers say the BBC is left-wing doesn't mean that it is. Just because a lot of people believe something, it doesn't mean it's true. Okay, a lot of people, for example, well, you know, the earth is flat. There are plenty of people who believe that. It's probably not true, you know, but a lot of people believe it. And just because somebody believes it, it doesn't mean that it's true. And likewise, I've picked on bus drivers here, but just because a certain bunch of people believe it, it doesn't mean it's true either. Confirmation bias is something you may have heard of. So confirmation bias is when you find information that confirms what you already believe. Don't just accept evidence that confirms your, your hypothesis. The strongest research, the strongest, actively seeks evidence against your hypothesis, incorporates it into the narrative and argues the case. When I did my PhD, I purposely looked for um, data research that says the BBC is left wing. I, even though I didn't believe it myself, I actively sought it out and dealt with it in my PhD, which is why it was a strong PhD, which is why it got published. And also blunt explanations. The media are more critical of Meghan Markle than Kate Middleton because I've, I've seen this a lot with undergrad and postgrad dissertations comparing the media's reporting of Meghan Markle and Kate Middleton. And undergrads in particular, they say it's because Meghan Markle is mixed race because her mother is black and and that probably is unfortunately a factor but it's not the only factor it's not the only factor it's much more subtle than that Meghan you see the, the way I see Meghan Markle and I lived in the States for a while Meghan Markle to me is a, a modern independent professional American woman right she is what well, feminism in its best possible sense she's as good as a man she stands up for herself she has causes she says what she believes right and that's why the royal family found her difficult that's what what i think that's because i i kind of i've thought about these things a lot the royal family is basically stuck in the 19th century somewhere and what they don't want is a modern independent professional woman in the in their group saying their thing and the fact that she's mixed race is a factor but I don't think it's the main factor but don't just say a blunt explanation don't just say it's because she's black because it's much more subtle than that and you know test it and show the uh, uh, the data so those four things to avoid um, okay we're gonna have a, a break now so what I want you to do now folks is to I'll, I'll, I'll make the PDF available on Moodle uh, so this sort of describes the, the the course structure and your assessments don't get freaked out by the assessments but have a read of that um, have a think if you've got any ideas for research and we can kind of discuss them briefly and let's meet back on Zoom at 12.30.